Well, there's been quite a few changes since the last video I posted. I hope all of you are doing well and staying safe. In my free time at home, I've been doing a little bit of retro gaming. Specifically, I've been playing Fallout and Fallout 2. In Fallout 2, you can actually get a car to drive around the wasteland, and, well, I thought it might be fun to try to create this car in a die-cast form. I won't be creating it exactly as it is in the game, mostly because the car in the game lacks detail. So instead, I'll create a car based on the car in the game, and to make it fun, and a little bit different, I'll use some more unorthodox methods to achieve the look I want. The car in this game looks to be based on the 57 Plymouth Fury, and that is what you're seeing here, made by Mattel. I can't remember where I got this, but it's one of the higher-end cars that actually comes apart with a screwdriver, so no drilling out rivets for this one. One interesting aspect of this car is that the interior seems to be permanently affixed to the base. This won't be a big deal for this build, but you might want to keep that in mind if you ever plan to make a custom from this particular car model. There's a small post in the roof holding the plastic windshield in place. After I drill this out, I can begin working on removing the paint. Now the car in the game seems to be nothing but rust, which would make this an easy build if I wanted to replicate that look. However, I'm going to take some creative liberties and only remove paint in certain areas. I'll go over why I'm doing this later in the video. The main places I want to remove the paint from are the top areas, the hood, the roof, and back. I'll also remove some paint from the sides, but I'll also leave quite a bit. Here again, I'm using aircraft paint remover, but I'm applying it with a disposable brush instead of spraying it. Next, I'm going to come in and add in some dent details with a spherical burr tool in my Dremel. To use this, you just plunge it into the metal, and it will leave a small divot. By placing a bunch side by side, it gives the illusion of dents in the body. Normally, I take this way too far, so for this build, I'm going to apply the dents very sparingly. I'll leave a link to a video I did some time back where I went over the entire body of the car so you can see how that looks. After the dents are applied, it's time for a quick bath in some iron chloride. You can buy iron chloride from places like Amazon or just make it from hydrochloric pool acid and steel wool. This is, in my opinion, the quickest way to rust out a diecast car. The iron chloride reacts rather violently with the exposed metal, leaving the painted areas alone. As it reacts, it deposits a film of what I assume is reduced iron on the car's surface. Once this acid has eroded the surface to my liking, I rinse the car off under copious amounts of water without scrubbing or washing the surface at all. I don't want to remove the deposited film. Once I'm sure all the iron chloride is washed away, I set the car aside to dry. Once it's dry, it will take on a metallic gray color with dark patches. To get the final look, I simply spray the car with some testers matte clear coat and see what appears as my base layer. Now for this car, I want to go a step further and add more rust layers over the layer I just created. To do this, I'll use some burnt umber weathering powder that I'll add some isopropyl alcohol to. This will convert the powder to a wash that I can then paint all over the car. Once I have the car covered, I can set it aside to dry. Once it's dry, I can then go about removing a large portion of the wash with a paper towel that has a small amount of isopropyl alcohol on it. I'll only use a dabbing motion and make sure not to drag the paper towel across the car body. This will blend the two rust layers together, keeping the burnt umber layers in the pits and valleys, but removing it from the peaks, exposing the iron chloride layer below. After going over the car and then spraying this new layer with testers matte clear coat to set it, I should have a rather realistic rusted look to the exposed metal parts of the body. The paint will be weathered in a later process. Okay, so at this point I decided that I would need to cut out some sections in the back for the power plant. In the end, I could have gotten away without doing this, so I decided not to waste your time showing it. The tab in the middle had to be left there because that's where the post is that holds the car together. For the engines themselves, I decided to just freehand something out of brass on my lathe. The car in the game shows something on the back, and it's not very clear, so I say you come up with whatever you want. I chose to do this just because it's easy and different, and sometimes I think I'm the discount version of this old Tony. Anyway, after I make the parts, I will file them down to the halfway mark so I can mount them to the back of the car. Now, just as you were getting over the irritation of me using a tool you probably don't have sitting around your house, cue the glass torch. One of the things I wanted to do for this project was to incorporate some glow-in-the-dark features along with other materials not usually used in die-cast customs. 
such as glass. My idea was to create a sort of glass fuel tank that I had enclosed some glow-in-the-dark powder. The powder could be moved around inside the tank after I placed it on the car. When the lights were turned off, the tank would give off a green radioactive glow. Now I'm aware that the car in Fallout 2 is not really nuclear powered, it's I believe battery operated, but I'm kind of going more with the lore from Fallout 3 and 4. The trick, as is the case in general when working on these small cars, is that I'm not used to really making small items on the glass burner, but I did finally hack my way through it. To make the tank, I sealed the end of a small glass tube and then placed some glow powder that I got from United Nuclear inside the tube. I then sealed off the tube and began removing material until I got a size tank that I was sure would fit on the back of the car. I also had to be sure that I added a very small tab on the end for attaching something later. After I made the tank, I took some of the tubing where the glow powder had stuck to the walls and reduced it down in size by heating and drawing it out. This smaller tubing I'll be calling glow tubing from here on out. You can see here how I plan to mount the tank to the car. I originally thought to mount it in the middle between the two brass parts I made earlier. However, I didn't like how that would look, so I removed the passenger side part and will replace it with the tank. Before I do that, however, I want to weather the driver's side brass part. So I'll go ahead and mix up some more of the weathering powder wash and apply it. This time I'll use a weathering powder that is a bit lighter in color than the one I used earlier. Also, I plan to allow for some of the brass metal to shine through, especially on the edges. To connect the tank to the other parts of the car, I place a small glass nub on the end of it. I have some of this bright greenish yellow fuel line I purchased at an auto parts store. I was sort of excited when I first came across it because it looked as if it might fluoresce under a black light. Unfortunately, that's not the case, but that would have looked pretty cool. To the other end of the tubing, I plan to attach some of the glow tubing I made earlier. I did the best I could to shape it so that it would appear to come over the brass part and then disappear into the trunk. Working at this scale with glass this thin is really difficult. My burner tip is too big and thus the flame too hot and tends to just flame cut the glass. But eventually I was able to make something I was happy with. Okay, so I put the car back together so you could see the progress thus far. Also, you could see how the glow tubing was glued on with the fuel line attached. Now that all the glow details are in place, I figured I could go ahead and test them out with a black light. Cameras have ways to compensate for low light conditions and this alters the glow effect to some degree. But hopefully you get the idea. I wasn't looking to make it so that I could read a book in the dark with it or anything, but it is a lot brighter than I had expected. I should note that this powder also works well in clear and white resins. Had the glass been a complete failure, I could have just made the same thing in a clear resin, mixing in the glow powder. I don't think it would have looked as nice as the real glass, but I'm sure it would still look pretty cool. So now I'll start working on the interior and base of the car. I decided to change the interior from white to red. I felt the white would just be a bit overpowering and difficult to weather down to the correct look. In the end, I would just end up with an interior that probably looked brown and black. So to fix this, I decided to paint it red and weather that. This way I would not have to use as many weathering effects and the end result would still look red. One of the major mistakes I made when getting started in weathering techniques was to go overboard with them. I would tend to weather everything. After I was done, I would scratch my head and wonder why my custom, that I had just spent hours working on, looked so utterly bland. The answer, of course, is that weathering, when taken to an extreme, acts like camouflage. There's nothing for the eye to catch on to, so the vehicle takes on a very bland look. To offset this, I need to provide contrast to it. In this case, I'm using color, a red interior, and leftover red paint on the body. And although I haven't shown it yet, I haven't weathered the hood the same way that I did the body of the car. I just left it a gray metal. Again, this is done purely to offset the weathering on the rest of the car and provide details to catch your eye. By not weathering everything, you actually enhance the weathering that you do apply. It really is a fine line, and I see new customizers making this mistake all the time, just as I did. All of this is just a convoluted way of saying less is more. Once the paint dries, I can then weather it. I'm going to take the easy road on this and airbrush on ink. Ink is sort of a middle ground between paint and a wash. It's very thin, so it will tend to fill in the valleys, but it's also viscous enough to be used as a paint. 
The really nice thing about it is that it's very transparent, so it's easy to layer with compared to an opaque paint. This is very useful if you're weathering something with a lot of decals on it. You can still see the decals under the ink. You'll see this better later when I use it to weather the remaining red paint on the body. So at some point in the process, I lost my bug catcher. I didn't know it was a separate part from the engine and would guess it came up with the tape I used earlier to mask the engine from the red paint. I looked everywhere and though you may not know this, there are several days between the time I painted the interior to the time I realized it was missing. However, it's no big deal as I was planning to do something with it anyway since a large air scoop on an electric car would seem silly. In the end, I decided to leave it just like this but weather the engine to sort of hide the holes. I thought about adding something to the top, but everything I tried just looked like an air scoop. Next I'm going to go over the car with ink to weather out the wheels and the red paint. Normally I use a dust colored paint, but thought it would do something different this time and just use the ink. For the windshield, I thought about doing my normal bullet holes and broken glass, but I don't really see this in any of the images of this car, so instead I sprayed it with some matte clear coat. When it dries, it gives the windshield a hazy look I can do a car that's been sitting out in the elements for 75 plus years. All right, I'm finally at my favorite part where I struggle to put the car back together. A few things that I did off camera. After I airbrushed on the ink, I went over the body with some testers matte clear coat to set the ink and also haze out the glass parts I made earlier. I also went over the bumpers and the door handles with a chrome pen, something you've seen me probably do hundreds of times at this point. I'm not a huge fan of how the wheels came out with the ink, so I decided to go back over them with a light dusting of some tan paint. This helps give the car a used look compared to it's been sitting in a field look. After that, I pretty much consider this one done. You can let me know below if you feel I was able to capture the look and feel of the Highwaymen from the game and anything that you would do or change on the car. So I hope you enjoyed some of the more unorthodox methods here. All of them could have been done probably easier with more common methods. I do consider part of my job here as a means of entertaining my viewers and hence why I went the absurd way compared to the easy way. Several of you have asked about my upload schedule, why I don't upload as often as I did before. I'm working on a more in-depth answer that I plan to put in a future channel update video. But the short answer is that YouTube is no longer promoting this type of video due to, I assume, COPA. I'm experimenting with ways of getting around this. For example, these are now diecast cars and not a particular brand of diecast cars that I don't want to mention in video. I'm currently trying to figure out if my channel is marked for a slow bleeding death or if I can skirt around the issues. Time will tell. This doesn't seem to just be affecting me either. Looking at other customizers' channels shows a decreased view count for them also. This during a time when streaming content has never been more popular. Anyway, give me your thoughts below. As always, I appreciate what you guys do for me and look forward to the next video.